Well, my, my, my wife, Lorene, and I uh, came to this church 32 years ago this summer, way back in 1986, when we were obviously much younger, when this was just one campus, a one-campus church. We had one service, and we were called First Baptist Church of Geneva. Ronald Reagan was president. I had to actually look that up. I couldn't remember. Uh, and no one had ever seen a smartphone. So a lot has changed in those 32 years in our country and in the world and in this church. We now are three campuses, we have seven weekend services, and we have a new name. But in all the ways that really matter, we are also still the same church we were back then and even decades before that. We're a church absolutely committed to the truth of God's Word, to the transforming power of the gospel, and to the role of the church as the body of Christ in the world. We saw that last night as more than 700 people attended the Micah 6-8 event out at the Kesslinger campus. Anyone here able to go there last night? Good, a wonderful event that celebrated and taught us, reminded us of God's heart for the poor, God's heart for justice, God's heart for mercy. Well, my first role here at the church, as many of you know, was as youth pastor. And during those years, I was constantly looking for ways, just as our student pastors are today, looking for ways to help young people understand their faith in a more personal way, understand uh, who Jesus was and what he had done for them. And one, uh, I was looking uh, for ideas in these books that used, they used to make for guys like me, and I found an idea I thought I would uh, use. Uh, I've tried it. I, it was a game uh, that I did several times, and both times I, or all times I did it, it was a, almost the exact same thing happened. You set it up um, with a group of kids. I used it at our Wednesday night high school Bible study in those days. And we would, um, you took three or four kids out of the group and set them off to the side. And you told all the other kids to group themselves together in groups of six or eight. So you had these groupings of kids in clusters. And you had three or four off to the side by themselves. And then all you said to the kids off by themselves is, you said your jobs... Are your job is to try to get into one of those groups. That's all you had to say. Your job is to get into one of those groups. Ready, set, go. And what do you think happened? Total mayhem. <laughs> Just mayhem. Because the kids in groups instantly uh, locked their arms together, turned their backs to the kids trying to get in the groups, and became sort of impenetrable fortresses of human beings. They would not let those kids get in. And the kids trying to get in would fight and scratch and claw and push and kick and bite, trying to get into the group. Some of them ran and launched themselves to the air, trying to dive over into the group. And I realized I better stop the game. Somebody's going to get hurt and I'm going to get fired. <laughs> so I stopped the game. Happened both times I did it. And then I debriefed with the kids when they calmed down. I asked the contestants, the, the kids by themselves, why did you try so hard to get into those groups. And they said, well, you told us to. And I said, well, yeah, that's right. I told you to get in the groups. Then I asked the kids in the groups who had locked arms to keep those kids out. I said, why did you work so hard to keep them out? They said, because you told us to. I said, no, I didn't. I didn't tell you to keep them out. You, they could, you could have just let them walk right. You could have welcomed them in your group and nobody would have gotten hurt. But you didn't. What we talked about is there's something inside us as human beings that creates an us and them mentality. Something in us wants to be inside. We desperately want to be inside while keeping others on the outside. And today we're going to see how God deals with that same issue. It's been around for centuries as we open the book of Ephesians again today. Now our series right now, we're in the fourth week, is called Built to Last from the Great New Testament Letter to the Ephesians. And a quick review just to bring you up to speed to where we are today. The Apostle Paul is the author He's writing from Rome where he's in kind of a, under kind of a house arrest. He's waiting for a trial before Caesar. Caesar was the title of the Roman emperor who at that, in that day was the emperor Nero. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus uh, and uh, to other churches in that region, but mainly to Ephesus, which was a large, affluent, culturally diverse, mostly pagan city in the ancient world. And so far, Paul has reminded the Ephesian believers and us 
that we have been chosen and adopted by the Father, redeemed by the Son. We celebrated that here this morning through communion. And then sealed by the Holy Spirit. Paul then prays that God would give these believers, new believers, the spirit of wisdom, which is the Holy Spirit, by which they would know the glorious inheritance of Christ, who is above all things. And then last week, as we began chapter 2, Paul reminded them that they had one time been dead in their trespasses and sins, but God had made them alive through the grace of Christ. Now today we continue in chapter 2, uh, toward the end of the chapter, beginning of verse 11. I want you to notice the words that I put in red on the screen. I just, this is a way to sort of track how the outline, how Paul's thoughts are breaking down for us and they'll become the outline for us. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. Paul writes, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, Paul here moves from talking about how Christ has moved them from death, spiritual death, to spiritual life, and now begins talking about insiders and outsiders. First he says they were separated from God. They were at one time separated from God. That's the first point I want to make today. Some time ago, I got a call in my office when it was here at this campus, and it was from a man I did not know, had never met, who had never been to our church. And he just called the He started with telling me part of his story. Uh, He confessed that he had struggled most of his life with alcoholism and that he had hurt the people he loved most. He had lost his marriage and his family as a result, had finally recognized his condition, sought out treatment, and committed himself to a life of sobriety. And then he told me why he was calling. He said he had recently suffered a relapse and that he had been, in his words, kicked out of his church and told never to come back. And then he said, so pastor, I'm calling to ask you if I can come to your church. I remember hesitating for a moment because I was just stunned, sort of surprised and sad at, at the whole conversation and especially at his question. And then when I finally said something, I said, well, first of all, it's not my church. The church belongs to Jesus. And secondly, of course you can come to his church. Especially now when you most need to be there. Verse 11, Paul says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles. Now, the word Gentiles here means all non-Jewish background people. uh, Which would be most of the people in the Ephesian church that he's writing to. And it would mean, my guess is, almost all of us here this morning. It says, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. What he's talking about here is we know the ritual of circumcision uh, to the Jewish people had become a mark of God's covenant, the sign of God's covenant, and had been that by which the Jewish people had identified themselves as belonging to God. For centuries that had been true. He says, which is made in the flesh by hands. In other words, Paul's saying that while circumcision was a symbol, a significant symbol of the covenant, it was just a ritual. 
just a religious ritual and did not accomplish salvation. That's what he means by that phrase. And then verse 12, remember that it, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, I want you to see here that in this one sentence, Paul is kind of lighting a fuse to a great cultural and religious bomb that he's about to set off. And I say that because at the time, middle of the first century, roughly 60 A.D. or so, there was a great divide in that part of the world. And that great divide was between Jews and Gentiles. Between Jewish religion and culture, way of life, and Greco-Roman religion, culture, and way of life. More than a divide. It was uh, an absolute separation. An enmity. Even growing to hatred at some points. And Paul is calling all of that into light right here. Now the closest thing, I was thinking about this, the closest thing in our experience, in our lifetime in North American culture, might be the racial tensions that exist, have existed and still exist at sometimes some places in our nation. Might be political tension, which we've all seen in recent years. Might be uh, the tension between Judeo-Christian culture and Islamic culture. But he's talking about this enmity between people groups. The Jews considered themselves to be chosen by God. They had God's law. They had the prophets. They had God's blessing. They had the mark of circumcision. Furthermore, they considered the Gentile world, everyone other than them themselves, to be unclean, religiously speaking. The Jewish people referred to the Gentiles as the uncircumcision, meaning they are the unclean ones, the unacceptable to God. They are separated from God. You know them. That's how the Jewish people thought. Jewish people did not associate with Gentiles, would not enter their homes, and certainly would not worship together with them because they were them. They were unclean. And Gentiles and all the other non-Jewish people groups of that world at that time generally despised the Jews for that very reason because they knew how the Jews saw them. There was this divide. Now we know that most of the members of the early Ephesian church would have been of Greek or Roman background, meaning they had not been born into or raised in Jewish culture. But it's also likely true there was a smattering of Jewish background believers in uh, the mix of that church. So Paul says, remember, writing to the Gentiles, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That pretty much covers it all, doesn't it? Paul is saying that these Gentile believers were at one time not only separated from Christ, dead in their sins, but they were complete outsiders when it came to what the Jews considered acceptable to God. Alienated, strangers, no hope, and without God. But I think Paul's also saying something else here. On the one hand, he's reminding the Gentile believers of their position before Christ. You were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were separated from the promises without hope in the world. But he's also reminding the Jewish background believers of how they once thought of the Gentiles. He's saying, you, you once thought of them as outsiders. You saw them as having no hope whatsoever, and he's letting all of them know on both sides that that's now changed. It's now changed. Because those who were once far off have been brought near. And that's the second point today, brought near. If I ask you to think of and write down a list of the most famous walls in human history, and I gave you some time to do it, I guess I think most of you would put these two right at the top of your list. You might put right toward the top of that list the Great Wall of China, for example. It probably came to your mind. Now, the Great Wall of China uh, is some 30 feet tall in places, like 50 feet thick. Put that picture back up there. Leave it up there while I'm talking about it, okay? 
It's huge. Uh, it stretches between 4,000 and 13,000 miles in length, depending how you measure it, because it's all convoluted and curvy. It began over 2,500 years ago as a series of much smaller walls in smaller kingdoms. And then in about the 3rd century B.C., the first emperor of China cobbled all those little pieces of walls together to create the Great Wall. And it was the purpose was to fend off and protect his kingdom from the invading barbarian tribes to the north. Now, history tells us, interestingly, that the Great Wall of China really didn't work as a wall. The Mongols and the Manchus just came right through it when they were ready to invade anyway. But even so, the Great Wall became a highly symbolic thing to the people of China. It became a sort of a psychological and cultural barrier that protected Chinese civilization and strength. In fact, when I, w I was on a uh, sports team, sports ambassadors in 1982, we went to China and I was able to visit the wall right here. And our guide was a young man about my age. He was an interpreter, spoke English perfectly. And he told me on the bus driving away from the wall, this is what he said. He said, for me as a Chinese man to see the Great Wall is like for you as an American Christian to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Never forgot what he said. Interesting and also kind of a sad comparison. Great Wall of China. My guess is you might also think of a wall like the Berlin Wall. Built almost overnight on August 13, 1961. Some of you can remember that. 25 miles long, over 11 feet high, topped with barbed wire, armed guards. The Berlin Wall was created to separate uh, Soviet-controlled East Berlin from Democratic West Berlin. Played a huge role in a greater wall that we called the Cold War in those days. The Iron Curtain. Those trying to cross over from one side to the other could be shot without warning. Many of you also remember when that wall came down in 1989. Could mention a lot of other walls in history. If you look them up on Google, the Wall of Hadrian in England, dating from the Roman Empire, the West Bank barrier in Israel, which still exists to separate Palestinians from Israelis. The truth is, it's human nature to build walls, sometimes for, for protection, sometimes just for separation, us and them. And we build all kinds of walls, don't we? Some walls are physical. Some walls are cultural, some walls are economic, some walls are religious, but they're walls nonetheless. But here Paul says, in Christ, all of that changes. Verse 13, but now, you remember this is the second time he's used a but in this passage. Earlier he had said, you were dead in your sins, but God made you alive. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you, you who were near. For, though, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now the bomb goes off. And we don't see this as clearly in our culture from this distance from this passage as they would have seen it when he wrote it. The bomb goes off. You who were far off, the Gentiles, the unclean one, those that you Jews thought of as being without hope, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And we can miss this, but this is all imagery from the great temple in Jerusalem, which was the very center of worship for the Jewish people. It's where the sacrifices of blood were offered for the sins of the people. This is the rendition of what the temple may have looked like back in the day of Paul. Now, we know it was eventually destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. All that's left now is just the surface, the Temple Mount, it's called, and one uh, part of a wall, the western-facing wall, which is called the Wailing Wall. Paul is thinking about here how the temple was organized, how it was arranged. Here's another schematic diagram to help you see how it was arranged. The large structure to the left, the high one, contained what was called the Holy of Holies, where once a year the high priest would enter to offer a blood sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. He could only go in there once a year and only him. 
It was so holy, a place where the very presence of God was believed to dwell. And then there was a barrier, a veil, 60 feet high and 4 inches thick, that divided the Holy of Holies from everything else. Outside of that was the holy place. And then there was another barrier, and then there was the court of the priests, where the sacrifices were prepared, and then another barrier or wall. And then came the court of the Israelites, where the Israelite men could worship. And then there was another wall, and then there was the court of women, where the women could come to worship. And then there was another wall, and then there was the court of the Gentiles, all the way to the outside. And on that wall, there was an inscription that has actually been discovered by archaeologists that said, do not proceed any further out of threat of death. Gentiles could not go beyond that wall for threat of death. Now, to understand what this is like, I want you to imagine that we are, that this is, this building represents the temple in Jerusalem. This is how it would have been organized, at least in, in my mind. The Holy of Holies would have been up there in the choir loft, obviously. Right, choir? Holy of Holies. <laughs> then there would have been a big veil hanging down to separate that from the holy place, let's say here on the platform by the pulpit. And then there would have been the court of the priests, which would have been the sanctuary. And then out there in the lobby, at, behind that wall, would have been the court of Israelite men. And then the women would have been able to come as close as maybe down at the chapel. They would have had to be down there in the chapel. And then the Gentiles would have been out in the parking lot. We could not even come into the building. That's all of us. We would not have been allowed to get by the first barrier. And even then, there would have been four more barriers to get to where the presence of God was believed to dwell. Paul calls this barrier the dividing wall of hostility. Some are insiders, accepted. Some are outsiders, not accepted. I think that's what that man who called me years ago was asking me when he asked me, if, can I come to your church? He's saying, are there walls that you have put up that will keep me from experiencing the presence of God? Paul says, no. No, he's saying to the Gentiles, you who have been far off have been brought near. And he's saying to the Jews that those who you always thought of as being out there, being them, not invited, have been brought near. Because they're just like you. Back to Ephesians 2, verse 13. Paul says, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Remember the veil that was in the temple, torn from top to bottom, completely in two, at the moment of Christ's death on the cross. The barrier has been removed. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances, meaning the blood of animals is no longer required because the blood of Christ has accomplished our redemption fully, that he might create himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the, the hostility. There is no more separation. There is no us and them. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Again, we can kind of miss the power of these words. Stunning words. Revolutionary words. In fact, this is why Paul was in Rome in the first place. If you read the book of Acts, we did a series on Acts a couple of years ago. In chapters 21 and 22, Paul is in Jerusalem. He is preaching the gospel, uh, and he's preaching to Gentiles. He believes the gospel of Christ is also for Gentiles, and the Jews in Jerusalem don't like that. They get very angry, a riot breaks out, and they try to kill Paul. For that very message, the Romans sweep in, and they arrest Paul to save him from being uh, lynched, and they throw him in prison. He exercises his right as a Roman citizen to trial by Caesar. That's why he's in Rome. So this very message is why he's in prison in the first place. Look at this one phrase, that he, God, might create in himself one new man in place of the two. As I understand it, Paul had at least two words he could have used for new in this phrase, one new man. He could have used the word neos, which meant new as in recent, the latest edition of something, like today's newspaper been a lot of newspapers, but today's newspaper is the new one. It's the most recent edition, Neos. Or a car. 
most recent edition of a car. But instead, he uses a different word, kinos, which means something new in terms of kind, something that's never existed before. So neos might be uh, the latest commercial airplane to be built. You know, a 747, a 777, a 787, whatever the number. Kinos would be the Wright brothers inventing the first flying machine. A new thing altogether. So Paul is saying that when Christ died, he creates one new man. The coming together of Jew and Gentile. The, the idea of kinos, a brand new thing. Two people groups that were at enmity with each other, who would never ever come together, who would just as soon never see one another. He's brought them together in a way the world has never seen. He's creating a new thing. Then he says, they are being built together. That's the third thing today, built together. I was able to make a trip um, to Turkey in about 2003, one of our first teams that went to that part of the world. We have um, supported work in that part of the world for many years now as a church. And we were able to visit uh, the site of ancient Ephesus, which is um, ruins now, all these years later, but they're spectacular. Able to see the great uh, outdoor theater where, where a riot had once happened. Paul was there. We were able to see the Agora where Paul would have set up his tent making shop. Able to see the ruins of the Temple of Artemis. All those things. So that was ringing in our, in our heads as we had seen that. And then on the last Sunday we were there, we visited a church in the city of Izmir, which is about 30 or 40 miles uh, north of the ruins of Ephesus. So right in the same region. And that church that met on that day was on the second floor of just an ordinary office building, only about 75 to 100 people were in the entire church. So less than half of the people that are in this room right now. So small, and one would say, you know, kind of, kind of insignificant in light of the whole, the whole thing, the whole world. But it was an ex ex a remarkable experience, one I'll never forget. Let me try to describe it for you. Worship that day was led by a Swedish family a mom and dad and a couple of their kids played all the instruments and they sang. Um, they were Swedish, they sang in English, and the words put on the screen to follow along were in Turkish. The pastor who preached was a German man who was a worker in Turkey. He preached in Turkish, translated by an Iranian woman into English. The congregation, people, us sitting out in the congregation, were made up of Turks who were Muslim background followers of Jesus, Christian workers from Mexico, Bolivia, South Korea, South Africa, Australia, Canada, and a handful of us from America. I remember thinking to myself in the middle of the worship service, this, there is no way this should work. <laughs> there is no way this should work. Not just the languages and all that. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the people groups themselves. These were people who, without the one thing they had in common would be at enmity with each other. Not only would not worship together, but would not speak to each other and would not acknowledge each other. And yet they did. I thought then, with all the languages going on, that this is what Paul was talking about 2,000 years earlier in the same region. I also thought that'd be a little bit of what heaven would be like. Everybody worshiping all these different languages, and we all understand what's going on. Verse 19, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. First, notice the expressions of identity. You are... No longer strangers. You are fellow citizens, members of the household of God. Remember in chapter 1, Paul has already said, you've been chosen, you've been adopted. Now he's saying you've been adopted into the family, the household of God. And then he moves to a completely new analogy. He starts talking about a building. And when he talks about a building here, he's talking about the church. The church is a foundation, he says. Jesus Christ is the foundation. By his blood, we are adopted. By his blood, we are redeemed, purchased. By his blood, we are made alive. We are made one. Then he says the apostles and prophets. Then he says, you also, 
to you as all of you, Jews and Gentiles alike, being built together into a holy temple. Remember the images of the temple in Jerusalem? Remember the presence of God was believed to be only in that one place, only way up here, behind the veil in the choir loft, separated from everybody else. Everybody else had to be kept outside. Stay outside, especially you way out in the parking lot. Stay out there. Remember that image? He now says, in him you also are being built together into, listen, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's extraordinary. He says, in Christ, you who are once dead, you who are once separated from God and from each other are being built together into a place where God dwells by his Spirit. We are what God is building in the world. We are the dwelling place of God by his Spirit. So here's a question. We were once far off, every single one of us. We have been brought near. But there are people living all around us, in our towns, in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, maybe even in our families, that we think of as outsiders, as them, far from God, maybe even as unclean. Who are the people that we think of as having no hope without God in the world? Paul is telling us that God is not in the business of building walls. He's in the business of destroying walls and taking those pieces and building them into something holy where his spirit dwells. And that's the church. You bow with me as I close. Lord God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for drawing us near. We who were once far off, you brought us near through the blood of Christ. Thank you for what you are doing in the world, destroying the barriers building your church. And thank you for inviting us to be part of what you are doing. It's in your name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just before the benediction, let me remind you that this is the first Sunday of the month, and it's the day we always take our benevolent offering. So as you leave, if you're able to, uh, share with the benevolent offering. We use this to support people and families in our church and in our community throughout the year who need help. Receive now the benediction. And we go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who draws us near through his blood and then builds us as one into his church. Amen. Have a great day.